pick a cloud. And welcome to another episode of Goldsmacked. I'm joined again by my good mate, uh, Patrick. And I'm not sure if you're going to be... Actually, now we're doing a different technology, so you're probably not going to see Patrick, who's there for me, and I'm probably there for him. And you're probably only going to see him when he says something. G'day, Patrick. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well myself. Fantastic. Now, I missed out last week. Yeah, me too. That's, you know, hey, well, anyone wants to get on our backs, send us hate mail. It's okay. Like, this is not... Uh, this is not an obligation. This is something we just do for fun. And uh, hopefully everyone else who's watching it enjoys it too. I'm waiting for the hate mail. I can't wait. <laughs> it means that we haven't been doing our job at this no hate mail. That's probably right. And hey, listen, mate, the first hate mail to arrive might actually be from ASIO, according to that article from the ABC. However, I noticed in the article that no one from the ABC actually commented. So it's probably just some left-wing reporter going and reporting on right-wing stuff and, and trying to stir up some divisive. Well, you know, there's, there's, there's the problem you've just mentioned is to, you know, what do you, who do you believe and what do you believe? I mean, there was a thing on, on Facebook, MSN reported that um, 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 one of the drilling and mining companies has been given permission to destroy 40 Aboriginal sacred sites. Saw that one. Okay. And then straight after that, there was another one from the ABC News saying that it, that was not true, that they had, not, they had actually stopped. And, and the company itself said, no, we're not going to do it. We put it in abeyance for the time being. You know, and, and to be honest, MSN, you don't trust anything MSN says anyway. They're just um, extreme. They're almost like Fox News, in my opinion. But, uh, and I don't necessarily like the ABC either. They're, they're somewhat biased. And we're losing... Uh, um, our main news source here in Australia, aren't we? They're closing down the end of June, I think it is. Oh, the um, AAP, is it? Yeah, yeah, they're gone. Well, just on just on the ABC, though, right? How about the? Uh, <laughs> I think it was the it was the ABC official uh, who reported about that thirty year old guy who died, you know, up in the mining town. In, I think it was in Queensland. Thirty year old guy dies. Uh, he refused to go in the hospital, and it was reported that he died of COVID nineteen. Right. Despite, you know, all these other comorbidities, yada, yada, yada. No, he died of COVID-19, ABC reporting. About two weeks later, and I put this on Facebook, about two weeks later, the ABC, not writing a retraction, just writing another article, writes about how the coroner had done his, you know, his, his investigation, done the autopsy, and it turned out the guy didn't even have COVID-19 in his system. Mm. Not even antibodies. Not even antibodies. Nothing. So, so he, the poor bastard died. I mean, that can't be disputed, I guess. But, um, you know, he didn't die of COVID-19. He didn't even have it. Yet because he allegedly died of COVID-19, all of these resources were scrambled to this town to go and test thousands of people. It's a bit like the... Um, it's a bit like the, uh, I was going to say the riots, but the protests on the weekend for uh, that whole uh, BLM stuff, right? Of course, the Australians have to get in the mix there. And, um, you know, now, of course, the New South Wales Police Commissioner who, who signed off on the original one at the last minute has now said, well, anyone who, anyone who protests this Friday from, um, from BLM will be arrested. And uh, he's also going to the Supreme Court to stop another one from, um, <coughs> from refugees who want to uh, who want to go on protest. It's a little bit hypocritical to try and shut the gate when the horse is bolted. But quite frankly, you and I, I know, months ago, were saying there's going to be something around about now, which the government does or lets happen. A bit like the Ruby Princess thing, right? Yeah. Let's let's let all those people go into the community. The government will do something that will cause, uh, has the potential to cause at least, further infection, giving them the man, the you know, perceived mandate to go and get tough again. So we'll see. New Zealand, everything's open. Go figure. All right? You know, and the other thing is, is the, the, the total confusion as to what one can and cannot do or what one should or should not do. I mean, kids can go back to school, but people can't go back to work. You can have 20,000 people at one particular um, demonstration or protest, but when 3,000 people want to go, they say, no, you can't have it because of COVID-19. There's just total inconsistency. 
And I'm not saying that they should consistently ban everything. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, even if 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 it was a bad thing to go, um, how would you know whether it's the right thing to do or not? Because there's just no consistency in, in in the in the reporting. Now you mentioned, for example, that guy that died up in Queensland. Apparently, there are three positions on a death certificate, and there's the cause of death, there's the uh, secondary cause, and then there's the underlying condition. Okay. Now, if the underlying condition is COVID, in other words, it was there, but they didn't die of that. They died of a, a blood clot because they had, you know, whatever going on. They still, they still died of COVID, all right? So all of the, the figures are way over the top because they're including deaths that were actually not COVID deaths. There was an article from the UK this morning, right? Yes. Over, over, half, of the, over half of the cases of deaths in, in the UK reported as COVID probably aren't COVID. Well, Italy did the same thing a couple of weeks ago. They were going through through their health department all the records to find out just how many actually died, and they they believe it's well under half. Mm. The figures are very very different to the reality. So, you know, again, it comes down to what do you believe and who do you believe, and how do you believe anything that's coming out? And and of course, the latest thing is this thing called deep fakes, where they can use AI, you know, to 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 generate um, very plausible. Uh, and very credible uh, video, um, which never happened, but it's all done through AI technology. So how do you believe anything these days? Absolutely, especially with the deep fake AI stuff, you know, and it, you say, as you say, it's very plausible. In fact, it's so plausible, I guarantee you, without someone taking a critical look at the pixels or whatever, no average person or even above, if someone wants to call themselves above average, no person would look at a video done through deepfake AI uh, and question it unless, unless, the, unless the claim by the person was so far out there, like, you know, like Donald Trump admitting to, to raping someone or, or Barack Obama admitting to, mm. to stringing up a, a, a black guy or whatever, right? Unless it was just so far out in left field it was coming back in three times from the right, everyone would believe it. So as long as the narrative of the video is kept close enough to something that people would believe, no one's going to question it. You know the, the, the old song, a little bit of sugar makes the medicine go down, mm. right? Yeah. So it's the same thing with information. If you make it just palatable enough, people will swallow it. Yep. But, and I'm not saying that all information is false. I'm not saying that all people are speaking lies, but you just don't know anymore. You just can't be certain of what is truth and what is not truth. Um, I was having lunch with somebody just the other day and they were talking about George Floyd, okay? Now, he's, well, he was, he, apparently he's six foot six and they're saying, well, they counted the pixels and his coffin was only five foot six long. How is that possible? I mean, come on. <laughs> Can you tell me that that coffin was five foot six long? I mean, the conspiracy theories coming up now yeah, are just... Oh, yeah, I, I get it. But let, let's deal with fact, just George Floyd. Right now, um, disgusting way to die no matter what. Uh, didn't deserve the way he died no matter what. Um, his death is being leveraged. I don't care what anyone says. Uh, it's being leveraged by multiple sides, some in particular. At the same time, he was a career fucking criminal. Uh, it's being reported through, I think, believe it was through the coroner that he was on meth and a couple of other things. Whether that's true or that's being doctored by the cops just to make it look better, I don't know. But his 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 court records and criminal records are a matter of you know public record. That that said, does the guy deserve to die that way? No, he doesn't. And I just you know, <laughs> now, now let's let's go on, let's go and plant the seed of a new of a new conspiracy theory. And you know, oh, heaven forbid. A theory is just a theory, whether it's a conspiracy theory or not, it's contextual to the person either saying it or the person listening to it, but it's just a theory. Nonetheless, let's just have a bit of fun, because I'm not one to, to, to spread conspiracy theories in the negative sense. But the big, the, the big mantra, apart from the whole BLM thing, which has been going about leveraging this thing, and that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting, that whole BLM movement, right? That's an interesting movement to look into. Who finances them and who they then finance. That's a very interesting thing. It's not just, most people probably think this is just a hashtag on Twitter and, and Instagram. It's not. Look into it. It's very interesting. Nonetheless, the big mantra that's been going around since 
Mr. Floyd unfortunately perished in such a despicable way is I can't breathe. Right? Mm -hmm. And I just found it a very interesting thing that the word conspiracy comes from the Latin con, two words, con spirare. Translates to breathing together or with, with, um, Breathe, yeah, with to get yeah. With, breathing, with the breathing or with the with the with the breathing. That's an interesting. Like, I just found that. You know, I mean, <laughs> now I'm not saying anything. <laughs> Maybe I can't breathe. I can't breathe was a message, but uh, no, but I don't want to. You know, like I said, let's, let's just you know, it's a despicable thing that happened. Um, I don't want to make light of it. It's just an interesting sort of observation that that's the mantra that's going around and. Um, People are talking conspiracy theories, yet the word conspiracy comes from that, those origins. Anyway. That's an interesting, yeah, I, I don't know if it's a genuine connection, but it is certainly a very um, serendipitous It is, isn't connection. it? <laughs> yes. Those, those um, who want to go and make something with it, they will. <laughs> I'm just giving them some fuel. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure with the 100,000 people that are watching this, somebody will. We should be so lucky. One day, yeah, with 100,000 people, we reckon we might get a little bit of hate mail in. Anyway. Uh, it's interesting, though, that, you know, for that, it was like nine minutes he had his his um, knee on the guy's neck. Why didn't they just simply handcuff him and yeah. stand him up? I don't, I don't understand, because clearly there was a lot of emotion between those two. They worked at the same bar, apparently. George worked inside security and the copper worked outside security and, and George had to handle them the checks. He didn't cut the checks or write the checks as we say, but they say cut the checks. Uh, that was all done by HR or whoever did it in the club. He just handed them out, physically gave them. So there must be, there must be a history there of some sort. But uh, just keep you, you know, it would have been professional to hold him down, cuff him and stand him up and put him in the car with the, you know, un as he gets through the door, the whole bit. That would have been so simple. That would have been so simple. So now people are saying it's a false flag. It was done on purpose to stimulate this, to take the eye, people's eyes off of some other subject. But I posted on Facebook a, a, a YouTube thing and about, um, and it was all these black successful people talking about racism. People like Morgan Freeman, right? He, he's, he was asked a question by, I forget the guy's name, he's, in, he's another black reporter on, on American TV and a really good, basic, solid reporter. And he said, have you experienced racism or has racism got anything to do with income in, in America? And, and Morgan Freeman simply says in that beautiful voice of his, well, of course not. Look at you and me. It hasn't caused us any problems in terms of being successful. It's about getting off your backside and learning or achieving or doing sweat to get somewhere. Uh, the same with um, uh, Denzel Washington was saying similar things. And, and Morgan Freeman once said, look, I'll tell you what, if you stop calling me a black man and I stop calling you a white man, that, that's the end of racism. That's all we've got to do. we just got to stop talking about racism, which I, I taking from that, that he's not mean sweeping under the counter. It's just let's move forward and let's just work with each other, irrespective of whether you're black or white. Just stop talking about it. And now these are black people talking, so it's not about white perspectives and that stupid white all lives matter concept. That's just ridiculous. One of the guys was saying, um, this all lives matter is ridiculous. If I went to the doctor and I had a broken arm, um, would the doctor say to me, well, it doesn't matter, all bones matter? Well, no, this is one bone giving me a problem right now. We've got to focus on it. So there's, there are a couple of perspectives to consider. But... Um, 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 did you see that link that I shared with that particular? It's, it's called um, "What the Left Won't um, Tell You About the um, um, Black Lives Matter Myth or uh, Racist Myth," something like that. It was. Did, I, did you did you see that? I don't recall seeing it. Maybe sure I I I'll, I'll, put it I'll put it up. It's from MRC TV. That's uh, very interesting uh, to see the all, all, every single one of them were black. All right, all saying quite the opposite of what we've been shown on TV, and yet they never get, it never gets spoken about. Um, it's like uh, I know that Bill Cosby's got somewhat a tainted reputation, but he, a number of years ago, it was on, in an interview, and he said uh, his, his problem is that all these black people are complaining and whinging and bitching, right? And yet all, 
Martin Luther King and all of the, and, and Malcolm X, they struggled and lost their lives in order for you to go to university, for you to rise above where you are now. And there you are sitting on your ass, you know, taking drugs and joining gangs instead of moving into the areas where you're going to be successful. How dare you, you know? So a lot of these black people are putting it back on their own people um, uh, that they are, in fact, the source of the problem themselves. I mean, I don't think Barack Obama, for example, whether you like him or, or not, doesn't matter. The point was he was successful. Michelle Obama is successful. Kofi Annan was successful. <coughs> there's, no, there's no barrier. It's about your attitude and whether you're willing to get off your backside. Now, yep. probably going to get some hate mail from that, I hope. Probably, yeah. And I mean, it's the same as same as the story here. You know, I, I read be, before this whole um, Australian BLM protest took place last week, I read something that, you know, oh, the injustice of uh, Aboriginal deaths in custody. You know, they've been in, uh, since 19, whenever it was, uh, 80, 90-something, 1990, whatever it was, there have been 400 Aboriginal deaths, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm not sure the exact date, but anyway, I went, I went searching the web, right, for Aboriginal deaths in custody. And I came across a statistic which, uh, let, me try, let me try and get the dates right, because I think, I think it went to 2004, so that'd be right, 1990 to, two, 1990 to 2004 or something like that. So it was a 14-year period, uh, or 15-year period, or something like that. Uh, so, and, and, and unfortunately, the stats I got were that period, that, so half of the period quoted by the people saying, you know, 400 Aboriginal people died in, in police custody in Australia between 1990 or whatever it was and, and 2020, 30 years, right? I'm like, yeah, that's terrible. But I looked at this, these stats and they're from the Australian Bureau of Statistics or whatever the hell government organisation it was. Um, and in the first 15 years of that 30-year period, there were 150 Aboriginal deaths in custody, right? Mm-hmm. 250 left, right? And there was a spike around the mid '90s, and it sort of t- you know, tethered off. The interesting thing was that the non-indigenous deaths in the same period were four times as many in custody, right? Um, and it's like it's just another case of lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? I read another thing, uh, was it last night, which said that, um, was it in Australia? I think it might have been in Australia, that, um, yeah, in Australia, that, poli- that the number of um, Indigenous youth who, had, who were pursued by the police through the courts for a um, uh, non-indictable quantity of cannabis, right, was there was 84% of the indigenous and versus 52%, whatever it was, of the non-indigenous. And so the report turned that around and basically instead of taking the bigger numbers, took the smaller numbers to be able to say that the percentage of bias against indigenous was four times because... Oh, four, the police were four times more likely to give a warning to non-Indigenous because it was 40-something percent versus what the, giving a warning to Indigenous. And it's, again, it's a classic case of lies, damn lies and statistics, you know. People, people take these numbers and they just turn them whichever way they can to be divisive and to support their own ism or dogma or whatever it is they got. Yeah, look, it's disgusting. I saw. I know the same thing. Like you know, we're talking. They're constantly trying to bring up more and more road rules and laws and 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 strengthening what exists, all that sort of thing, because of the number of deaths on the road. But if you go to the site, and I can give you the link later on if you want, there's statistics there that go from uh, the year uh, 1900 to today, or actually to about 2017, I think it was, and. Uh, in 1970, when seatbelts started to become legal requirement, we were running at a, uh, about 25 or 26 deaths per 100,000. Now we're down to 3.4, 3.3, despite the fact that there are like 10 times as many cars on the road. 
And um, so the deaths have dropped dramatically. And yet they're still saying that um, uh, because of the high number of deaths, um, we need to uh, fine you more. We need to smash you over the head more. And yet the deaths are right down to less than four per 100,000 and something like less than one per 100 million kilometres driven. So if you look at the facts, you'll realise that we're being given spun material here to try and justify just putting more and more levies and taxes, although they're called fines, okay? They're just justifying these levies and taxes, um, which really we don't need. It's the same as this 110 kilometre hour limit. You know why it was chosen in the first place? No. Because that's how long it, you know, there was a certain distance required for a car to stop in a safe, at a, in a safe time. And the maximum they could do that was about 70 mile an hour, 110 k's. Well, today, cars can stop in half the distance with their ABS and their vented discs and, you know, their better tyres and better suspension and, and, and all their electronic stability. They stop in half the distance or less. Yeah. So, really, yeah, yeah. you could be doing 190 kilometres an hour and still be safe. Which, which I love and have done many times in Germany. And it's a phenomenal thing to be able to do on the roads of the right. Here's a question for you, though. Those, those numbers, right, with regard to, let you know, like you're saying, the deaths are down and, uh, and, and, and the deaths per 100,000 and the deaths per million kilometres and the rest of it, right? Are they attributable to seatbelts or is it just safer drivers or is it just safer cars? Is it that we're being a bit more considerate? I don't believe it's necessarily seatbelts because, you know, my mother is still alive today because she wasn't wearing a seatbelt when she had an accident. In New Zealand, she had to swerve to miss an oncoming car that came into her lane in the country road, and she went off the road, slammed into a tree. But because she wasn't wearing a seatbelt, she was thrown out the back window, and the engine block landed in the driver's seat. So she wow, really must yeah, she, she she lost she lost sight in one eye, and one of her ears was sort of hanging off at the time. <coughs> but she would have been dead. Yeah. In that situation, I, I hear what you're saying, but I think in the vast majority of situations, a seatbelt saves lives. And in fact, um, 12 months after the seatbelts were introduced, uh, it went down by half, the number of deaths, okay? And then it continued to drop because cars became, you know, radial tyres became standard, uh, disc brakes became standard, at least on the front. Um, 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 then we started to get crumple zones, etc. And, and uh, radio. you what? Sorry, everyone got a push button radio, well, <laughs> which made it easier. Didn't have to fiddle right. with the dial. Yeah, that's right. So, I understand what you're saying about that particular situation with your mother, but the general, the general, con uh, the general um, reality is that seatbelts do save lives. There's just no question of that. Why do they have them in race cars, for example? You know, admittedly, much more complex than a, a, a simple lap sash. But nonetheless, they're seatbelts. I, I, I dare say because the driver is a more valuable asset than the vehicle itself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> you want to protect it. <laughs> Look, in that, you're right in that case because, let's, you know, this is supposed to be a business con uh, uh, conversation. So let's just go for that for a minute. There's a certain amount of money raised by the sponsorship and the, and, and the stickers and the painting on the side of the car. Mm. But the driver is the one that generates the money with their with the way they turn up to special events. Uh, they sell um, uh, marketing material, they sell T-shirts, they sell photographs, they sign autographs, and all of that is paid for by the general public, and they raise far more money than the, um, the signage on the car. So you're right, they are worth more. I mean, obviously, human beings worth more than a car anyway, but that's a philosophical perspective, but we're talking from a financial thing here, and you're right, they are worth a lot more than the car. They generate a lot of income, um, when, particularly when you look at particular certain drivers. You know, Craig Lowndes, you know, was, was the new Peter Brock in terms of his smile and the way he, had, he approached the public. He was loved. Even if you were not a fan of the car he drove, you just liked Craig Lowndes. Very few people hated him. And the same with um, uh, Peter Brock. These people raised huge, huge numbers uh, of income for their, their uh, sponsors and their teams because of their, their persona. So you're right there. But it comes, just going back to our subject matter, it, you look at um, passive restraints, you look at active, in my car, right? 
it's got pretension of seatbelts. So as soon as you're in an accident or it recognises something's going wrong, the seatbelts pull tighter. It's got ABS. It's got um, um, uh, active suspension. It's got airbags, all this kind of collapsible steering column. These are all they're both passive and active systems that save lives, and that's why they're coming down. However, I would have to say that we're having more fender benders because there's more people on the road and more people from a particular socioeconomic and demographic place who just have no concept of spatial awareness or situational awareness. I won't mention them, um, but they are impossible drivers. I mean, there's a reason why you don't see these particular people racing professionally because they're incompetent, totally incompetent. Love it. So I won't mention these little people. <laughs> um, but they, you know, living in Sydney, they're just terrible drivers. You don't see them up here where I am, of course, but then in Sydney, they represent about 11% of the population, so we're having more fender benders, but we're not having as many deaths. I was going to say, if you want to know which demographic um, Patrick's talking about, you can go on Google, what is 11% of the population of Sydney? Yeah. So in as much as I'm happy to get hate mail, I want to get hate mail on, on you know, valid and real subjects of me. That's just not a thing worthwhile yeah. getting, informa- uh, getting hate mail on. And, I, and you know, I was, a, I was about to post something on your last post and I was about to say that, you know, I don't, individually, I don't have a problem with any of them individually. Okay, it's um, they treat me with respect. I treat them with respect. It's it's the it's the collective attitude that's going on, and that's why all this particular um, pushback against this country is justified. Even though Asia is saying, "Oh, it's racist." Well, no, it's not. It's just about food security, water security, um, um, military security, and we're losing it. We're losing it big time. Yep, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm like yourself. I don't have a problem with any any specific race, any specific ethnicity or whatever. Uh, the, 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 the issues for me start when the people are identifying as part of the economic state machine repre- you know, that represents their original ethnical background. So in this sense, whether, whether it's... It's Indian, Chinese, Philippine, Arab, Australian, American, German, whatever it is, right? Um, the pe- I lived all over the world, uh, enjoyed being a guest in so many countries and, and participating in, in those countries in, in the way that I would expect other people to come to this country to, to participate and to behave. Um, uh, it's just every, every, every... Australia is no different. Australia has its... its public face and undoubtedly the Chinese people who are being fed, um, you know, what their government tells them, especially with their social currency system and all the rest of it, are, uh, probably believe that we are the, you know, the, the, the devil incarnate, you know? Mm. And that's the thing that really annoys me. These other countries, India has done the same thing. You know, one Indian gets attacked or whatever um, not because they're Indian necessarily, but because they were there and, and these people wanted to do something to somebody. And then they start calling Australia generally as racist. And, and I just get, particularly from countries that are themselves racist to the max. I mean, I've known, I'd have worked with a Chinese guy who'd been in Australia at that stage for about 20 years. And he said that um, Asians in general, but Chinese in particular, believe they are the superior race. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not racist? Come on. Um, in India, you look, you've got the caste system. Please don't talk to me about Australia being racist when you've got the caste system over there and what it does to people. Um, get your own house in order before you start looking over the counter. Absolutely. And uh, the interesting thing there with the Indians, right, is Australia recently signed that uh, defence pact with them. So, and uh, the Indians and the Chinese about, have been having a little bit of a stoush on the border again. I don't know if you read about that one. The, um, the, uh, the, the last time they did this, the, the Chinese went in and had a, had a pretty sort of definitive win. And now with the latest up, you know, upheaval, they've gone and they've erected some buildings there. So the Indians are about to respond. And, of course, Australia has so, uh, signed a defence pact with them. So Australia may be drawn into their fight with China. So China not only is now beating the drum 
uh, saying <laughs> don't, don't go down the route of aligning with USA. They're also saying don't align yourself with India. It seems to me that Australia's aligned itself with a whole bunch of people who don't want to align with China. So maybe that's um, maybe we just need to be aligning not with China and with everyone else, and maybe China will back down if we stand up to the bully. Well, I, I saw an article where it, it indicated that China was pulling back from that particular confrontation. They're in the process of pulling back. I haven't seen that one yet. See if I can locate it. Well, the trouble is I see a lot of stuff on Facebook, and when you go back to it, it's gone. It doesn't reappear. Um, just new stuff. But it was there as saying something about the dragon has retreated or something. It was a, a title like that, the dragon retreats. Right. So hopefully that's the case, you know. But, you know, there is so much going on that we don't know about. I remember that time when uh, in the Middle East when um, uh, Saudi Arabia was positioning like 350,000 troops on the border and um, um, Iran, which is aligned with uh, Putin or with Russia, they were saying that that's a threat, that you're not actually doing war games or exercises, you're actually preparing to invade. And so Putin said, listen, if you, uh, if you start to come across the border, we will fire tactical nukes out of cannons. So they're small yield nuclear weapons. And so then America said, well, if you do that, we're going to fire missiles at you. We came to within a millimetre of World War Three there, a nuclear war. Uh, and it was only because Putin blinked and pulled, pulled out of it and stopped supporting the country for that point in time that it all went quiet again and Saudi Arabia pulled their troops back and all of the other countries that were supporting Saudi Arabia, they had troops there as well, Turkey, etc., and they pulled out as well. We came very close. None of that was reported, by the way, not in the mainstream media about how close we came. But it just comes back to our very first comment about what do you believe? Who do you believe? How do you believe it? What's, you know, it's getting harder and harder, mate, to know exactly what's going on. And then the theorists have got a bigger voice because of that, which just muddies the water even further. Um, you know, there's one guy, for example, who's really well respected. What's his name? Maybe I shouldn't say it because I'll just get stuff from him trying to shut me down. He's that sort of person. But he's a highly respected man with a beard, Australian. I think his first name's Max. That's all I'll say. But apparently he's a solid member of the uh, Flat Earth Society. Which society? Flat Earth. Oh, really? Yeah. So if a person believes that, how can you trust anything that they say subsequent to that particular statement, you know? Well, I personally don't believe the Earth is flat, but I'm, I'm more than happy for him to have that opinion, you know? Um, if, he, if he gets to the edge of the Earth, looks over and sees something, I would love him to report it back and actually <laughs> take a fucking selfie, right? Interesting thing, though, just to bring a couple of things back into one context, right? Here, you know, because you know my passion is education, right? So yeah. the other day I was having a conversation with one of the parents outside the gates, and of, 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 of outside the gates of the school where my son goes, and the um, school's community well-being officer, yes, not the, not the counsellor, the community well-being officer, in the best Jerry Seinfeld way, sidles on up and starts listening on the conversation. And it got to a point where I was, you know, we were talking COVID and a few other things and how the stats are all out. And I uh, said, you know, I just made the comment about lies, damn lies and statistics. To which her immediate response was, oh, you're a flat earther, are you? I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, this is the quality of the mind of the people, of some of the people at least, to whom we entrust the well-being of our children in the school system. I, I don't know, you know, listen, clearly she has some synaptic bridge neural pathway in her brain that connects that statement to me believing the Earth's flat. And again, you want to believe the Earth's flat? Knock yourself out. I don't. It's not my place to tell you you're wrong. But that sort of thing, I mean, shit. I know, it's, um, I'm surprised she didn't say bah a few times in, in between words because she's just one of the bloody sheep, isn't she? Oh, totally. You know, and, 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 and she's one of the sheep being led around by the pigs on an Orwellian animal farm called school. Mm. I, I personally refer, you know, this is also coming back to what I was saying before, 
I personally think that schools right now are these government black sides because there you go. There's another conspiracy theory. Yeah. There's government black sides. Parents aren't allowed on, right? Yeah. Uh, but kids, you know, kids can go on there, no problem. As soon as they get off, they can't sit up to social distance. But anyway. Well, they can pack together like sardines on a bus. Mm. One of the statistics I'd like to know about, and we're going to sort of jump, we keep jumping around, it doesn't matter. One of the statistics I'd like to know about is how many construction workers from China are currently on the ground in Victoria under the Belt and Road Initiative de- um, yeah. deal, right? That'd be a question. They're allowed, they're allowed to set up Australian companies so that they can bid on, you know, basically an Australian company fully owned by China uh, to bid on government contracts. They win the government contracts and then they're allowed to import boatloads and plane loads of Chinese workers to go and work. So how many Chinese workers are on the ground in Australia working on government contracts, one through Australian companies owned by China through, uh, and, and made possible through the Belt and Road Initiative that the Victorian government signed on to? Another question, so that's one thing, So, because that's that's personnel on the ground. And I realise the Yangs have got, I don't know how many it is now, it used to be 80,000, it's probably about 30,000, 40,000 now uh, personnel on the ground at, uh, in, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the Northern Territory, Pine Gap and other places, right? But ha- So that's one question. How many people on the ground from the China, Chinese government? Mm-hmm. Two, how many people are on the ground and what else is happening at Meridian Airport? Or yeah. Meriden, sorry, Meriden Airport in WA? with their 99 year lease and how many people are on the ground and what are they doing up at the port of Darwin, which the Chinese own, you know, it's like the length and breadth of the country has become a strategic beachhead. And that's right. And that's why I can't understand Asia starting to get up in arms about this, you know, all this race, so-called racist talk when they themselves have said that, um, not only, not only those particular installations, but they have um, boots on the ground in universities and, um, and in organisations, you know, Friendly China, Australia, whatever it's called, Foundation, etc. all of these which are funded by the CCP, they're concerned about it. But when a general member of the public says it, now they want to say, oh, that's racism, we're going to have to increase it and strengthen our anti-racist laws to shut this down. Why? ACA is concerned. They said it. They were concerned about it, about the amount of infiltration into business and politics and universities and, and education. They're, they're very concerned about it. Yes, it doesn't help when the is the, is the human rights commissioner in Australia. I don't know if he's Chinese. He's, you know, and I, uh, this sounds this is good. People can say, "Oh, you're you're a racist." Sorry, his name just sounds Chinese. Whether he's Chinese, Singaporean, Taiwanese, whatever, I don't know. Yeah, Vietnamese. What is, I don't know what he is. There's obviously, you know, an Asian gentleman. Um, I have to look into oh, that. Right, sure. Yeah, so I don't, I don't. I have to look into it before I make further statements. But you know, it probably helps that um, something like that, some a person like that, is in that sort of position. Sort of like the guy who's head of the uh, World Health Organization is um, is pretty much China's man. And I had to laugh, right? The that whole COVID. Although the the Chinese are still bashing us about the the um, the demand that there's a COVID investigation. Uh, the World Health Assembly is now going to go and do an independent one, and China has sort of said yes, okay to that, right? Apparently. But who runs the World Health Assembly? The World Health Organization. Who's the, who's the top guy of the World Health Organization? A basic nobody who is Chinese, who's China's puppet, mm-hmm. who for a month into this whole COVID thing was basically parroting word for word the Chinese narrative about corona and COVID and all the rest of it. That's right. And, and there those two articles that you shared about the Lancet and the um, the medical, uh, the other medical paper in England having to retract all the statements they made about the inefficiency or the um, inefficacy, I should say, of, um, of hydroxychloroquine. And now they've had to retract all that because that was all false data purposely put into the, 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 the research papers. And then now it turns out that it was, it is in fact, Efficacy uh, uh, does have efficacy. Yeah. So that's and, the World and, Health Organization. Yeah, and, and they restart their trials. Go figure. Yeah. But again, no talk of zinc. That's what I find interesting because what my understanding is it needs the zinc to transport it into the cells on its own. It doesn't get into the cells. You have to transport it in. It's the right. It's the wrong ionic. Um, 
Was it the zinc that was the transport or the other thing was the transport for the thing? I don't remember. Transporter. Oh, okay, right. There you yeah. go. It was from a, a site on YouTube called Medvac or something. It was, and uh, they've been doing this sort of every few days. They've been putting up updates, etc. And this was early on, about two months ago, that I saw this. And he, he had the whole thing on the board there. He had pictures of cells and and, and uh, positive and negative ions and chemicals and stuff. And he's clearly a scientist, and he's showing what has to happen. And uh, it's the zinc is, is the transporter. It, it attaches to the hydroxychloroquine and allows the hydroxychloroquine, which has the wrong uh, positive or negative ion attachment to get in. But with the zinc, it can get in, and then it does the job of preventing the, um, the, um, um, the DNA or the RNA, the RNA from um, doing its job and just kills the cell. So it'd be interesting to find out who financed though that study or those studies that were published in both those journals and trace the money. That's the thing. Always, if you if you follow the money trail, you'll get to the truth. Yeah. No matter whether it's a crime or, or it's politics or anything, even philosophy, you follow the money trail, you'll get to the source of, of where it's all come, the font. Absolutely. It's sort of like, you know, I, I heard a thing about... Um, World Health Organization claiming that they've got a, well, I don't know if it was a 200 million or a 2 billion or some huge amount of money deficit, uh, uh, yeah, uh, deficit, right? Because of COVID-19. And I'm like, you're the World Health Organization. How do you get a $2 billion, whatever it was, 200 million, 200, I think it was $2 billion deficit because of COVID-19. What is it you're doing with the money? Seriously. You're not yeah. handing out face marks. You're not handing out vaccines. You're not financing uh, vaccine stuff because other people are doing that. You know, what are you doing with the money if it's not, and, and, and you know, hey, I'm not making any accusations. I'm just positing a theory here. Given the extreme disconnect in actual deaths and cases and all the rest of it and what we're now seeing is the reality of those deaths and, all, and, 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 and you know, the, the reporting that was done versus the actual reality of the number of deaths. Someone, I mean, the doctors themselves have come out and they've been censored. They've, they, their videos have come down off YouTube, have come out saying, you know, here are the instructions from World Health Organization. If this exists, then if this condition exists, then reported as a COVID death, basically, right? And there have been enough cases uh, of Big Pharma. What was that big? I can't remember the, which company it was. It was one of these big companies had like a $2 billion or trillion, whatever it was, settlement with the US government because they paid 44,000 doctors, this is years ago, right, to, uh, with regards to one of their, their, their medicines. It's, there's precedent in that industry, in the pharmaceutical and medical industry, there's precedent already that doctors get coerced and financially coerced to, I'm going to go on the limb here and say falsify or at least if they're not falsifying, taint the documentation, twist it, yep. skew it to go in a certain direction so that we get the lies, down lies and statistics. Yep, that's right. And How else do you create that deficit? And of course, we have to go soon. It's yep. going to be 12 o'clock. But just finally, legislation was recently passed in America where companies like Bayer and, and Monsanto cannot be sued. Yeah, you have to sue the government. Hmm? You have to sue the government. That's right, because when you sue them, right, if you do try to sue them, then it's the... Um, HHS. Uh, HHS. Yeah. And then there, of course, they are supported by the Attorney General's Department. So now you're fighting the government, not Monsanto or DuPont or Bayer or whoever. They can't be sued directly. Isn't that it's a wonderful... Like yeah, it's, it's crazy. You, you, you have to sue and fight the people who are there supposedly protecting you. It's sort of like saying, um, you know, I have, to, I, have to protect, I have to sue my parents, you know, for something someone else did. Yeah. Because they're, gonna, they're defending the other person. Yeah. Yeah. This guy beats me up. I'm a kid. That kid, that kid over there beats me up. So I go to my parents and say, hey, mum and dad. He beat me up, and now they defend them against you. Yep. Say, oh, what did you do to him? The, the logic buys me. me just, yeah. And, of course, we don't have a voice. 
Well, maybe we can. We need to get enough independence. Uh, we'll go back to that discussion another time. We need to get enough independence um, into into Parliament and uh, shake things up. Because I think uh, all along, isn't it? Yeah. Elect only independence. Yes. No Liberal, no Labor, no Greens, no National Party, no nothing. Just independence. And, and I realise there may be some level of chaos initially, but quite frankly, I'll take the chaos mm -hmm. and let the dust settle. Because I think what comes out of it is going to be a far superior solution to what we have right now. Paul Lang for Prime Minister. I'm going to start putting it up on uh, Facebook. <laughs> Mate, they'll decimate me anyway. It wouldn't take them too long. It'd take them all about 30 seconds to find enough crap about me. <laughs> Paul Lang Hanson will look like a, like a freaking angel compared to me. <laughs> now, that's going over the top. I can't see that happening at all compared to her. Um, if you'd said Dastiari, perhaps, now there's another person that needs to be taken out and put into, be, made to become a labourer, because he, he's now a political commentator talking about corruption. Go figure. Him, of all people. And Richardson, you know, his printing company gets burnt down and there's, it's under suspicious circumstances. Now he's talking about corruption in the government. Please. Oh, really? What was that movie, um, Catch Me If You Can, with with uh, DiCaprio? I can't remember the play, the guy he played in it, but there was a it was a real life character uh, who, by the age of fourteen or whatever it was, fifteen, was flying jet planes and ca issuing counterfeit checks and everything. Uh, and now he works for the FBI as their top uh, consultant with regard to uh, fraud. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, in that case, though, I think that was a good move. But in the case of Dastyari and Richardson. <laughs> Please, make them labourers. Get them out of the public eye. Anyway, mate, you've got another appointment to go to. Yes, we go to. Um, I will, uh, well, listen, hey, if you uh, like what we've uh, talked about, like us. If you hate what we talked about, hate us. Um, either way, tune in next week. Uh, we'll be talking about, what are we talking about next week? We'll figure it out. Yeah. We're trying to talk about the fact that because you've got male pattern baldness does not mean that you're a skinhead. <laughs> I love it. Done. We'll do that one. All right, mate. Have a great day. Thanks very much for tuning in, everyone. See you later.